Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you for joining us for another webinar. Um, we have uh, Dr. Grossman here. I'd be very lucky to have her. Um, as you can see, the, uh, we'd be talking about the truth about gender. This is the first part of a two-part series. Um, for those of you who may not be as familiar with Dr. Grossman, um, she's a practicing physician, author, uh, and a public speaker. She's authored uh, four books um, and has been over countless um, radio, news, uh, television shows, and uh, she's even lectured at the British House of Lords. Um, Dr. Grossman graduated with honors from uh, Brian Moore College from New York University Medical School. Uh, her internship in pediatrics was at Beth Israel Hospital in New York City, and her residency was at uh, North Shore University Hospital, Cornell University Medical College, uh, followed by fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry. Uh, she is board certified in psychiatry and uh, in the subspeciality sub of child and adolescent psychiatry. Um, you can find more about her at Miriam Grossman md.com that's miriam grossman md.com uh, and i say um the she's published a lot of books i think the um, latest one um on unprotected uh which goes into um basically for campus girls in campus and how the sexual revolution has negatively impacted women um uh, as well as that, she's got a book on um, You're Teaching My Child What, which goes into the sex education, which is uh, which we'll touch upon as well, uh, and, and so on. Um, so, so we've got a special presentation here with some new technology, which I've not seen before. So I'm excited to, to have uh, Dr. Grossman with us and as, as we talk about uh this whole idea of gender uh um it's it's, it's lovely having you uh dr grossman thank you so much for having me and i'm sorry to be late um i would have been on time but the technology is pretty tricky and um so i'm doing something a little unusual over here which is that the slides of my powerpoint are supposed to be the background the virtual background, but um, anyway, let's get started. Welcome to everybody. Thank you for being here. When I graduated from medical school, I took an oath. I stood up, I raised my right hand, and I swore to prevent disease whenever I could. At the time, I assumed that my fights would be against cancer, heart disease, schizophrenia. But I've been practicing medicine for almost 40 years. And I now realize that the biggest fight in my career is not against dangerous diseases, but against dangerous ideas. One of those dangerous ideas is that sex is separate from biology. We are being told that sex is not determined by chromosomes or anatomy, it's determined by feelings. That that's, your feelings are who you really are, that that's what counts. So if Jill starts to feel that she's a boy and she changes her name to Jack, and she cuts her hair and she wears boys clothing, we are told that we must believe that she is a boy. And if Jill gets pregnant, we are told that she is a pregnant boy.
Hmm. Okay. My slides are not advancing um, the way they should be. So let's see. Uh -oh. I'm sorry, everybody. Okay. I'll have to do it that way. So we are told that we are told that Jill would be a pregnant man. This is a very dangerous idea because the denial of biology is the denial of reality. And not living in reality is dangerous. This idea has had devastating effects on children, families, and society. Mind you, it's not difficult to refute it or to invalidate it because we have logic and science and common sense and reality on our side. But it doesn't matter because challenges are not allowed. Debate is not allowed. Parents, doctors, therapists, and teachers who object to this ideology are demonized. Professionals lose their jobs, their license to practice. Parents may lose their children. That is tyranny. And that's the most frightening thing of, of all. Today, I'm focusing on the history of gender gender ideology, where the idea came from and why it is false. And next week, we're gonna talk about the harmful consequences of gender ideology and what can be done about it. So I wanna begin by just clarifying the meaning of the term sex and gender. And I want, it's very important to get this right because I'm always coming, everyone is always coming across improper use of these words. And it's not just an academic thing. It goes to the heart of the issue. Most people believe that gender is synonymous with sex. Um, for example, here in the US, I don't know if you have gender reveals. Ali, do you have something called a gender reveal there in the UK? Yeah, yeah, we have the... Um the balloon and then you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, these are called gender reveal parties, but actually it's not a gender reveal party. It's a sex reveal party um, because sex is not the same as gender. Um, I became aware of this over 10 years ago when I began to study sex education for a book that I was writing which ended up being called, you're teaching my child what? Because I was shocked to discover what students are taught. One of the things they're taught is that sex is between the legs and gender is between the ears. The American Psychological Association in a guide for students explains the difference between sex and gender. And they say sex is assigned at birth it refers to one's biological status as either male or female and is associated primarily with physical attributes such as chromosomes, hormone prevalence, and external and internal anatomy. Gender identity refers to a person's internal sense of being male, female, or something else. So the American Psychiatric Association was saying, and still is saying, that gender is a feeling. Feelings can change. A boy is not necessarily going to become a man. We are teaching students. A girl is not necessarily going to grow up to become a woman. So again, sex is, is biology and gender is a person's feeling or a person's perception of themselves. So they're not at all synonymous but they are used that way. And I'm sure that you've noticed in places where the word sex used to be used, now gender is used. Long ago, uh, not so long ago, the driver's licenses here in the US and other 
identifying um, documents would indicate um, sex, male or female, but now they use gender. And I'm going to ask the question, why is that? Why are the two words being used synonymously? It may seem trivial, but it's not trivial. It is very significant. George Orwell taught us that language is an instrument that can be shaped for a specific purpose. What is the purpose of substituting gender for sex? How does it affect our thinking? The purpose is to change society. Advocates of gender ideology believe that the world will be a better place when the distinctions between male and female are eliminated. You might remember the pregnant man, quote unquote, on Oprah. That was a very important moment. I'm sorry, I thought I had a picture of that. The pregnant man on Oprah was a very important moment. A man cannot be pregnant. However, if you separate male and female from biology and you want people to believe that biology is irrelevant, then you, in you can invent the term pregnant man. And that is what Oprah did in 2008. And she was hailed for it. In 2008, a long time ago, was the first time that um, a transgender woman uh, went on Oprah, sorry, a transgender man, a person who was born female and then um, <clears throat> transitioned, <clears throat> transitioned to um, be male, but did not have her, um, her reproductive organs removed. Uh, and got pregnant and appeared on Oprah and Oprah called this person a pregnant man. So replacing sex with gender foists this, this agenda on us, especially on unsuspecting, impressionable young people. And I can tell you from firsthand experience as a child and adolescent psychiatrist that a price is being paid for misleading people in this way. So before going further, I do wanna get an important issue out of the way. And that is that there are very rare individuals, very rare, who from an early age, typically between two and four, are convinced that they were, um, for lack of a better term, born in the wrong body. And this condition was until about 2012, considered a psychiatric disturbance. It was called gender identity disorder. Oh, there we go. There's Oprah. Gender identity disorder. Um, so, these are kids who are persistently distressed day in and day out from a very young age. And they either believe that they are the opposite sex or they want very, very much to become the opposite sex. Um, this is not the same as the recent group in the past 10 years of adolescents that are presenting with gender dysphoria. But this, is, this was called gender identity disorder. It ranged from one in 30,000 people to one in 110,000 people, very rare. And the proportion of boys to girls was six to one. These people suffer a great deal and they deserve our understanding and our psychiatric help. I am not speaking about these people today. I am speaking about how psychology has normalized a disorder. Psychology currently says that if a boy hates being a boy, he hates himself, he wants his genitalia removed. 
that this boy represents a normal variant of child development. So psychologists are telling us and psychiatrists that he's different, but he has no psychological disorder. In cases such as this, we're told that our concern as clinicians should be with society, with society's antiquated restrictive views about what's male and what's female. And so we're supposed to find fault with our culture for stigmatizing these individuals and for thinking that they have a disorder and that therefore society needs to change. Now, how did we get to this? Not, uh, how did, how did we get to this point? So the word gender used to be a grammatical term. It was used to classify nouns as masculine and feminine. For example, not in English, but in many languages, certain words are masculine or feminine. For example, in French, the word book is masculine and table is feminine. That was how gender was used. It was used in grammar. Sex, on the other hand, categorized living things as male or female. So gender described nouns in a grammatical way and sex described people. Then along came someone by the name of Dr. John Money. Dr. John Money is a very important figure. The ideas, the ideas about gender that we are discussing and that have, without exaggeration, revolutionized our thinking about what it means to be male and female, his ideas have led us to the point where 11-year-old boys are being given estrogen and mastectomies are done on 13-year-old girls. This is the person right here, Dr. John Money. Dr. John Money was doing his work essentially in from the 1950s forward. And he was interested primarily in what was then called hermaphrodism, which is a rare medical disorder in which both male and female organs are found. Now, someone who used to be called a hermaphrodite is called intersex. And um, it occurs in about two cases in 10,000 births. Um, at the births of one of these kids, there are urgent questions, if you can imagine. Is this a boy or a girl? Um, what should the family be told? What should friends be told? What kind of name should the child be given? John Money pioneered the work in what was called sex assignment, the complex decision of whether to raise a particular child with hermaphrodism as male or female. He was considered an eminent professor and he opened up the first gender reassignment clinic in the country, in the United States at Johns Hopkins University. What do we know about John Money in terms of his personal life? He came up with a radical theory about a fundamental feature of the human race. And his theory has had very far reaching consequences. So who was he? We know that John Money grew up in a farm in New Zealand. And we know that as a child, he witnessed explosive acts of violence against his mother. His father terrorized his mother and John. His, so his father beat both his wife and his son, John. And John was left very ambivalent about his masculinity. John Money wrote, I suffered from the guilt of being male. I wore the mark of man's vile sexuality. By that, he's referring to his male genitals. I wonder if the world might really be a better place for women, if not only farm animals, 
but human males also were gelded at birth. Gelded means castrated. Um, that's the word that's given to the procedure when it's done on animals. Remember, he grew up on a farm. So he saw this being done to animals. And as a child, he wondered if the world might be a better place for women if human males were also castrated at birth. So we see from this is very, very revealing statement about John Money, he was quite open about it. He himself had what we would call now gender dysphoria, discomfort with his biology, with his male genitals. It's not surprising that given his earliest model of masculinity, an unstable and cruel father prone to violent outbursts, it's not surprising that Dr. Money came up with a theory that would allow a person to assume an identity separate from their biology. His own father was a monster. He wanted to be as different from his father as possible. And his theory provides a way for that to happen. John Money's theory said that aside from a few physical characteristics, biology is unrelated to one's identity as male or female. Our anatomy is fixed, but everything else he said is due to culture. So this was a time in society when there was a great debate over nature versus nurture. What caused the differences between men and women? Was it it was it nature, meaning chromosomes and hormones, or was it nurture? Was it society and the way and the messages that little children get as they're growing up from their parents, their siblings, other family members, school, teachers, and so on and so forth. So John Money argued, and he was very passionate about this argument, that it was the culture that determines a person's masculinity or femininity. He argued that we are, are all born like a blank slate, that there's nothing about us that makes us either feminine or masculine. It all has to do with how we are raised. So he introduced the concept that infants are born gender neutral. And he said, psychologically, we are all hermaphrodites, meaning that we all have the potential to be either male or female. And he borrowed the term gender. This was the first time that gender was being used outside of a um, grammatical context. John Money used the word gender to describe people to describe an internal sense of who they are. Um, I also wanna point out that Dr. Money was one of a number of accomplished social sciences at that time who argued that pedophilia and even incest were not necessarily a bad thing. He referred to ped pedophilia as a love affair between an age discrepant couple. And he wrote that a childhood sexual experience such as being the partner of a relative need not necessarily affect the child adversely. Um, so this is quite a shocking thing, but again, he, um, he wasn't shy about his views. Um, I'm, I'm going to say that John Money was a confused and a dis emotionally disturbed individual. So um, his life was dedicated to promoting his gender theory. The thing is that it was very hard to prove. How do you prove his theory? It was all speculation until a family with a very unique problem arrived in his office. 
And this incredible story that I'm about to tell you is documented in the book, As Nature Made Him, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Girl by John Colapinto. This is, it, this is the book, you must read this book if you are interested in the history of gender. Um, it, it's, it's required reading. I think that it's out of print, but copies are still available. So the story goes like this. In 1965, a young couple from Winnipeg, Canada, by the name of Reamer, gave birth to identical twin boys, who they named Bruce and Brian. These boys were 100% fine at birth, but during Bruce's circumcision at eight months of age, something went wrong with the equipment that was being used and his penis was burned, completely burned beyond repair. The Reamers were desperate for months until they heard Dr. Money on television explaining that gender identity is not inborn, it's learned, it's not due to biology, it's due to culture, and that a boy could be raised as a girl. The Reamers turned to Dr. Money, and when Bruce was 22 months old, because of doc following Dr. Money's advice to them, when Bruce was 22 months old, he was castrated. In other words, he, the circumcision had destroyed his penis, but his testicles were still intact. But Dr. Money advised the parents to have his testicles removed and to give him the name of a girl and to raise him as a girl. They, they were also told by Dr. Money that under no condition should they ever tell their son that he was born a boy. So the Reamers changed his name to Brenda and she was raised with dolls and dresses alongside Brian, the twin brother, who was given trucks and GI Joes. This was in the 60s. It was a different world. And kids were certainly given, <laughs> at that time, they were often given very um, sort of stereotypical toys. So this was the perfect test case for John Money because Brian was the quintessential matched control, a genetic clone of Brenda's. Okay, this was a very unique situation, a perfect situation. John Money's, um, the answer to his prayers, because he had been writing and speaking about his gender theory for years, but he could never prove it. Here's it was his chance to prove it. He could prove to the world with this case that gender is determined by environment, not biology, and that being male and female is all in the mind. John Money followed the twins for 10 years, even though they were living in Winnipeg, but the mom, Mrs. Reamer, was in touch. He, she would write letters to Dr. Money with updates, and the twins would be brought down once a year to visit him. After 10 years, John Money declared the experiment a complete success. Brenda Reamer became John Money's most famous patient. Of course, he used different names. At a time when nature and nurture was a huge controversy, it became a landmark case in psychology. This is Brian and Brenda. The Reamer twins were held up as proof of Dr. Money's theory, and his ideas were accepted and taught as dogma, that it's all about how a child is raised and socialized, nurture is what makes the difference, and all those messages that kids get from parents, grandparents, teachers, cartoons, 
they are what count, not nature, not chromosomes, not biology. And this was a huge, huge considered a huge breakthrough for society. And um, the 70s were a time when feminism uh, became very, very big and uh, a powerful social movement. And John Money's theory about gender was certainly welcomed by feminists because it, uh, it, it upheld the view that, that you know, men and women really were pretty much the same, could really, uh, should have, well, they should have the same opportunities, but in relationships and in society and the way that we think of men and women, we should, we should, uh, we should be raising them uh, as if they were neutral from birth, and the way that we raise them is going to determine their futures. So therefore, uh, the feminist movement said we have to really raise our kids very differently. Um, so uh, this was a huge thing, and parents all over the world that faced similar circumstances as the Reamers did, either due to an accident or due to a medical condition were advised to castrate them and raise them as girls. So fast forward about um, 30 years, almost 30 years and to 1997, Brenda came forward, but she wasn't Brenda anymore. She was David. David was a janitor in a slaughterhouse. He was married and had three adopted children. The entire thing had been a hoax. The experiment had actually been a failure. Far from accepting his gender reassignment as a girl, David had fought against it tooth and nail from the very beginning. He had refused to play with dolls. He had ripped his dresses off. He preferred wrestling over cooking, and he even urinated standing up whenever possible. Brenda had been teased relentlessly for the boyish way that she moved and spoke and gestured. Kids called her cave woman from the time she started school, from the time she was in kindergarten at age five. She never fit in. She didn't fit in with the girls because she was too much, too boyish. And she didn't fit in with the boys either because she appeared as a girl. And boys of that age usually don't play with girls. So from an early age, she was an outcast. Kids called her a cave woman. In second grade, she wanted to be a garbage man. And in eighth grade, she wanted to be an auto mechanic. After years of this nightmare, not only for Brenda, but for the whole family, Brenda's psychiatrist, who she had gone to because she was suicidal, urged her parents to reveal the truth. Part of what was going on at that time was that she was entering puberty and being given estrogen so that she would develop as a female and Brenda realized that she was attracted to girls, to other girls. And this was very, very upsetting to her. And she became suicidal. I don't know if it was only over that, but just the, her entire, she had a very, very hard, difficult life. She, um, like I said, she didn't fit in with her peers. Um, she was fighting with her parents constantly because she, felt like a boy internally and she wanted to do boy things and she wanted to be like her brother um, and be given the same toys as her brother and go out and play and get dirty. She was expected to stay clean and stay uh, with her dolls. Anyway, the psychiatrist urged her parents to reveal the truth. Do oh, I, I forgot to say that Dr. Money had told the parents to never ever tell um, Brenda that she had been born a boy. So despite uh, Dr. Money's warning to never do so, 
they gave in and the twins were 14 years old um, when they were both told that Brenda was born a boy. Speaking about that moment years later, David said, I was relieved. Suddenly it all made sense why I felt the way I did. I wasn't some sort of weirdo. I wasn't crazy. Brenda at once went back to life as a boy. And here they are together. Um, on the left is Brenda. Oh, whoops. There he is, David. He chose the name David because that's how it felt for him. The world telling him he was a girl and all the time feeling that he was a boy. He felt that he was like David fighting Goliath. That's why I picked the name David. It sort of sounds like a happy ending, but it wasn't because unimaginable damage had been inflicted on this family. Aside from being exploited by Dr. Money in his research, the twins were also sexually abused by him during their yearly visits. In fact, at the final visit that the twins had with Dr. Money, um, Brenda was so upset about what happened that uh, she ran out of the office and she told her parents that if she was ever forced to see him again, she would commit suicide. So unfortunately, these boys, both of them, were very damaged by Dr. Money. Brian died of an overdose at age 36, and David died from suicide at age 38. And their parents blamed Dr. Money for their son's death. I want to mention that for anybody who has more, who wants more information and to learn more about this, you can go on YouTube and there's a video that features the twins, the twins and their parents telling the story. The name of the video is um, the, the Boy Without a Penis, I believe is the name of the video. Um, you could also Google Reamer twins, David Reamer, um, John Money, Twin Study, things like that, and you'll get to it. It's very worthwhile listening to that and seeing the twins and the parents decide, uh, not decide, describe John, their work with John Money, those visits down there, and how they just implicitly trusted him. You see, the Reamer family was a blue collar family. Um, the parents were, didn't graduate high school. Uh, I don't even think they went further than maybe um, seventh or ninth grade. I'm not sure what that would be in the UK, but it would be like around age um, 13 to 15. And they were extremely impressed with Dr. John Money, who was sophisticated, well-spoken, um, a professor at esteemed university, Johns Hopkins University, where his clinic was, is one of the most highly thought of universities in this country. And they were just completely blown over by, by him and convinced by him and trusted him. And anyway, that, that really comes through in the video. Now you might think that when this fiasco came to light, that clinicians and social scientists would re-examine, if not completely reject, John Money's gender theory. Instead, it's David's story that's been rejected and almost ignored. Students don't hear about this disastrous experiment. In my four years of training as a psychiatrist, and then as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and during my 25 years of practice, attending meetings, reading articles, I never heard of this. 
I never heard of this twin study and what happened. I didn't know who John Money was. It was only when I started to research sex education for my book, You're Teaching My Child What, that I came across John Money and I came across the twins experiment. And I realized that gender ideology, gender theory, theory has been proven wrong, actually. Biology is a very powerful component of, uh, uh, of being male and female. But instead, John Money's speculations about gender are accepted as fact. He's hailed as a pioneer still to this day. He's thought of as a great professor and researcher. There's a fellowship at the Kinsey Institute which is the John Money Fellowship for Scholars of Sexology. And um, people can uh, win a certain amount of money, $3,000 um, to do research into, to become a scholar of sexology. And so, you know, obviously they're naming this fellowship after him. He's a well thought of person. What you will find at worst is that his theories are called controversial. So why is gender, gender theory false? How do we know that it's not true? Maybe biology isn't relevant to maleness and femaleness. Maybe it's not nature, maybe it is nurture. So actually in the 50s and 60s, it, it, given what we knew at that time about chromosomes, John Money's theory could have been plausible, but in this century, it is not. 50 years ago, it was thought that the Y chromosome carries very little important information. It was called a genetic wasteland. So just to um, review for you that females have two X chromosomes, males have an X and a Y chromosome, and that applies to over 99.9% .9 of human beings. Um, so back then in the 50s, 60s, um, the Y chromosome was thought to kind of be empty. And if that was case, if that was the case, it could reasonably be argued that if men and women have essentially the same genetic endowment, um, that the differences between them must be due to society's messages and society's expectations. Um, but now we, here's the X and the Y chromosomes. The X is the big one, the Y is the little one. We now with our modern technology, we can scrutinize hormones. We can map them out and we've done that. And we know that the Y chromosome is filled with DNA that is unique to males. I know that you can't see this, but this is a map of the Y chromosome. And I'm trying to indicate to you just how there's a, there's a great number of genes um, that are only on the Y chromosome that females don't have. So the Y chromosome is no genetic wasteland. Um, there are distinct male and female blueprints that are created at the moment of conception. This is the sperm penetrating the egg. Now, that fact alone tells you why when the phrase is used, uh, assigned male at birth, assigned female at birth, that is incorrect. Um, people are male or female from conception. At the moment that the sperm penetrates the egg and a new cell is formed, which is the zygote. And that zygote has either the DNA of two X's or, two, or an X and a Y. From that moment, that fetus, um, that embryo that turns into a fetus, that turns into a person um, is either male or female. 
uh, what's accurate to say is that a person's sex is discovered at birth or sooner, now that we have ultrasound, obviously, but it's only assigned at birth in those rare, rare circumstances that I was telling you about earlier in which there's um, an intersex person and their genitals are um, not clear. You can't, you can't, by looking at their genitals for half a second, um, determine whether they're male or female genitals. They have ambiguous genitalia. And in that circumstance, which is one in 5,000 births um, or even less, in that instance, you can say that sex is assigned, but not when you have a normal, a male or female child, which is the case in 99.9% .9 of births. Now, so there are distinct male and female blueprints, and this is a biological truth. It's eternal and it's not going to change. Neurobiologists acknowledge that from before birth, there's a male brain and a female brain. We are not psychological hermaphrodites. The prenatal brain develops in a female direction unless instructed otherwise. So the default brain is the female brain. But in a male fe fetus, there's a gene on the Y chromosome that tells the testicles to produce and secrete testosterone. And that changes everything. Testosterone prevents the development of a female brain. And by that, I mean one that has a larger center, for example, for communication, emotional memory. And those are just some of the very many differences between the male and female brain. And the testosterone, when it reaches the brain of the fetus, it establishes a masculine course. There's more brain space that's devoted to centers for action, aggression, and sex drive. The cascade of testosterone's effects are global and permanent. Some of them won't be seen for years, such as what happens at puberty. But the trajectory, the, um, the, what's another word I could use? Programming, programming actually starts at eight weeks. And I don't mean eight weeks after birth. I mean, eight weeks after conception. This is an eight week old embryo. If this embryo is a male, it has tiny testicles and those tiny testicles begin to produce testosterone and that testosterone goes all over the body, including the brain. Now, the research that supports this is voluminous. It's not something that's up for debate. Nonetheless, we are being told to believe that gender is an internal experience. Kids in kindergarten or even earlier are told you may not be a girl, you might be a boy. I'm gonna share with you a few research findings. Um, they may not apply to every single boy or every single girl, but they do apply to most boys and most girls. So for example, at one day of age, boys look longer at a moving mobile, whoops, At one day of age, a newborn boy would rather look at a moving mobile, whereas girls show a stronger interest in a smiling face. 
At one year of age, a girl's attention is drawn to a video of a face moving. Boys prefer a video of cars. <laughs> okay, that was at a year. At two years of age, girls make more eye contact with their mothers than boys do. And the amount of eye contact is inversely correlated with the levels of prenatal testosterone because girls make some testosterone as well, but much less than boys, meaning that the more, the more testosterone a little girl is exposed to before birth, the less eye contact she has when she's two years old. So this is basically indicating that the hormonal environment before birth has an impact on the brain, not only the chromosomes, but the hormones, and that's biology. Now, it is universally accepted that chromosomes and prenatal hormones predispose boys and girls to have specific toy preferences, styles of playing and interacting, and many, many other qualities and behaviors. Um, there's actually a specialty within medicine, a new specialty called the principles of gender specific medicine, gender in the genomic era. era. And it's a fascinating medical textbook. It's about, it's over 600 pages long. And almost every chapter is describing research that's been done that indicates that every organ system in the body is stamped male or female. There's a difference in every, every cell that has a nucleus, which is almost every cell in the body, is, is male or female. So when you study the heart, um, you study um, the liver, the gastrointestinal system, um, the immune system, is certainly the brain. Um, there are differences in these systems depending on the chromosomes and the, the, the hormones, the biology um, of the cell. And therefore, doctors have recognized that, for example, when it comes to cardiovascular disease, for example, um, men and women present differently. Heart attacks in women are different than heart attacks in men. And this is the same for different cancers as well. And for very importantly, the response to medication, we're realizing now that when we test new medicines, we have to also test them on women in the past because the women might be pregnant and they had um, their menstrual cycles and so on. So it was complicated to test medications in women of childbearing age, but we're realizing now that that's a mistake and women respond differently to medication than men do. So anyway, um, I'm just trying to highlight for you here that science has gone in the opposite direction of John Money and his gender theory. And you know what? We see sex specific behaviors in other mammals as well. Um, these are juvenile monkeys that were given a choice of um, like a, a, a doll to play with or uh, a vehicle and the, the male monkey picked the um, police car and the female monkey picked the doll. So does that mean that there are, um, that these monkeys were nurtured differently in the jungle? I don't think so. So science in the 21st century has discredited Dr. Money's theory. Gender theory has been invalidated. Male and female are distinct entities. That's an objective truth. We are not psychological hermaphrodites. Being male or female is not dependent on how you feel. 
that is simply false. And yet students are being indoctrinated, and I don't use that word lightly. Indoctrination is repeating an idea to someone over and over until they accept it without question. <clears throat> Children are indoctrinated to believe this theory. The idea has been institutionalized and it's taught as fact. Challenges are not permitted. Healthy debate does not take place. The message is stop thinking, stop questioning, go with the program or else. And I think that you can see, I'm not following that closely what's happening in your country there, but I know that there's a tremendous amount of debate that's going on. And I know I've been following what's been happening with JK Rowling and um, in your parliament um, and also in Ireland and Scotland and Wales. So I think probably all of you are aware that this is a very, very hot topic. Um, so if you don't go with this ideology, it could mean that you could lose your job. It could mean you could lose your license. Um, you will be demonized. And for parents, it could mean that you can lose your children. So here we are, a disturbed individual, John Money, came up with a theory. And for years, he exploited and abused a family that trusted him in order to prove his theory. He lied for decades. He even said he published something in the 90s um, that was still reporting the experiment to be a success. And even after the truth was revealed and after the suicides of both these men, Dr. Money never made any public statement about the fiasco. So, the story of David Reamer is a tale of one doctor's arrogance and his readiness to sacrifice a family in order to promote himself and his ideas. The same arrogance is seen now among those who indoctrinate young people with dangerous lies. So what happens when reality is denied? What happens when critical decisions involving identity, relationships, medication, and surgery are based on falsehood. We can ignore reality, but we cannot ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. And next week, we are going to talk about the consequences of ignoring reality. And that's it for today. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Grossman. Um, a while, uh, quite a lot to take in uh, for 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 that, um, and uh, it is it is fascinating that the the word that you've mentioned quite rightly is uh, indoctrination, as in um, we can't really respond to um, even with science, as you've sh shown uh, each cell in our body has a blueprint of male and female and it is um it is fascinating um uh so we have some questions and and so on which is um people are participating i know some of you may have had uh some issues um in in seeing the presentation but hopefully uh it is recorded so you can uh, see that if you did have any issues with, with seeing that um, on our Facebook page. Um, what we have now is um, an opportunity for some Q&A. Um, we have a few, um, few minutes for that. So what you can do is you'll, you'll see a Q&A section um, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and then you can ask questions through through that method. Uh, you can ask anonymously, or if you do prefer, you can also raise your hand and you can ask the question. If you do raise your hand, then your name does show publicly. So just just be uh, aware of that while while you're doing um, uh, while we're getting that. Um, just one of the um, questions which which I had um, was um, 
what, what are some of the um, things that we can be pointing to? Because um, we have a lot of people coming to us and then saying, okay, how do I combat the gender ideology? How do I combat that actually, you know, um, we have people who are say, they'll say they're intersex or they have um, both biologically. And then, um, you know, it's almost like the argument is, are we discriminating against them if we're not talking about gender identity? How, how do we respond to something like that? Well, um, you mean, how, how do you, you might be told that you're discriminating against intersex people. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Okay, well, first, so, so there's a world of difference between an intersex person and somebody who at the age of 12 or 15 um, starts to identify as the opposite sex. There's, there is a world of difference. Of course, intersex people, um, we see what the, what the gender, um, ideology has done is they have um, taken that that those rare instances of intersex and they it, it's sort of like they've co-opted you know as if as if they're as if they're in the same population like as if they're in the same group of you know and they're they're misunderstood and marginalized and um, not given the medical medical care that they need. Um, this this is not this is not logical. This is this is not um, this is not accurate. Um, the intersex person um, has a medical condition and does need often to have um, maybe medication um, and other medical interventions, perhaps surgery. Um, what's being done now with uh, babies that are intersex when they're born is that um, most of the time, I think nothing is done. Uh, basically, uh, the parents are told maybe to give a um, more of a neutral name um, and sort of, you know, see, see how the child develops over the years. Um, you know, there's that approach. It's not this aggressive because it's actually in response to the fact that we see that there's a huge impact of biology. Okay, so what was being done early on uh, was, you know, these intersex kids under John Money and other people were immediately like it was a big rush um, to to change their bodies and to um, you know I identify them as either male or female without waiting to see how the biology, what kind of impact the biology is going to have on the child, because it was thought to only be due to nurture. Okay, if it's only due to nurture, you could, you could justify that sort of approach. But now that we know that it's not, there's a completely different approach. But anyway, to get back to the question, it is, it is unethical for um, the transgender community to be drawing a parallel with intersex people. That is two different stories. And the intersex um, community itself, many people are very angry at what has happened, you know, and how everything has been politicized and sort of put in one basket. You shouldn't be putting these two things in one basket. Um, you know, the, the sex assigned at birth, how that is now being used to teach little children that, you know, oh, when you were born, a doctor or a nurse, just, you know, like, as if it's random, you know, the doctor may have made a mistake. Even though you have a penis, you may be a girl. Maybe the doctor made a mistake. This is the ideas that are being planted in little children that are very confusing and very false. For an intersex person, that is accurate, that a sex is assigned, and that may, and that assignment it, it's not random, but you know, it, later on there may be issues with that. But not for the vast, vast majority, 99.9% .9 of people. And right now the epidemic of transgender people, it, it's a psychic epidemic. Um, 
it, uh, these are in kids that are, are not intersex. They have normal chromosomes. They have normal hormones. They are being led to believe um, that, that, that being transgender will solve their, their emotional issues. Um, most of these kids have, as you probably know, a variety of emotional things that are going on. They're, they have social anxiety. They're, they may be on the autistic spectrum. Okay, a, a, there's a large number of kids that are um, presenting as transgender or non-binary um, who are on the spectrum. And there are, there are clear reasons for that. We can speak about it more next time. Um, but they have, there's, they're not intersex. Um, and, and what's happening with this new group of kids, um, this, this uh, epidemic of kids now that, you know, have caused the, the numbers of um, referrals to the clinics to go up by thousands of percents, just thousands. Um, it, it's it's um, an unheard of a phenomenon. I mean, this tra transgenderism, as I said earlier, um, used to be a rare thing. Um, it was one in 30,000 to one in 100,000 people. And now there's some studies, there was one in the US that showed that 9% of kids in high school are identifying as transgender or non-binary, mm -hmm. nine in 100. So this is a psychic epidemic. It's a totally different thing. Mm, absolutely, no. Put put, put very well uh, the uh, differences. Um, we have uh, comments. Uh, we have uh, Najibe saying um, uh, almost asking if gender theory is false. Uh, why do you think it's common and very well supported uh, today? Yeah. Well, the thing is that um, John Money was a very, um, how should I put it? He dedicated his life to promoting his theory and he succeeded. Um, even though there was opposition to what he was saying, um, he was able to succeed in um, getting his ideas uh, you know, it, it entered academia, it entered the social sciences, psychology, sociology, anthropology, it took hold. Um, feminism certainly helped it to take hold also. Remember, we didn't know that the twin failure, the twin study was a failure until the end of the 90s. So, and he came out with this theory and was saying over decades, he was reporting that this was a success. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, it just kind of became entrenched. It became um, dogma. And, you know, now, you know, we, we certainly have tons and tons of research showing that we're, we're, whereas there is an element in nurture, of course, there's some part of it that's nurture but there is also a huge element that's the nature part of it. And, um, oh, what I should say is that the, the, this idea went into, you know, John Money, like many professors, um, had a lot of disciples and he had graduate students and he, he wrote articles and he gave talks and he was really out there. I mean, he was, he, he, he was known um, not only in the academic community, but in the just in, in the lay community, he became very well known. Um, he wrote books for the lay community and um, he really, he, he, pushed, he pushed his theory. He wanted to be, he felt that his theory was as important and as true as the theory of evolution. So <laughs> he saw himself as like a new Darwin Okay, he, he had a very big ego and he wanted to make sure that um, he left his mark and that gen gender theory, um, you know, was, was pushed near and wide 
and there were decades for it to become to become rooted and and that's where we are and then oh sex education picked it up so that it became it began it was taught to children um a long time ago it's not something new it was taught in the 90s it was taught in the early 2000s to children that um that gender that sex is between the legs and gender is between the ears and it's fluid gender is fluid gender can change throughout the lifespan this has been taught to kids for over 20 years so what people can do is and we'll talk more about it next week but you know the more educated that you can get the better and the more that you can talk about it calmly with the facts on your side um, and know the places online that you can refer people to. Um, and there are many places right now that have, um, there are wonderful resources right now in this area. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, oh, you know, I forgot to say that I, I cannot, um, I can't respond to, if you have listeners that have like individual questions about their own condition, unfortunately, I cannot help with that because this is a public situation. And when I, if I were to give my advice to an individual, that's, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being a doctor here. I'm just speaking. I, I don't, I don't have a doctor patient relationship with, with the listeners. So I'm okay. actually going to have to sign off. Okay. Um, no, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Miriam, for um, for being here and, uh, you know, to, um, and I know we started a bit late uh, to, today, but hopefully in, in, in Sunday, next Sunday, when we will have part two, we will be, um, there'll be a bit further time for, for Q&A and, and what, what is, is, is said here. Um, also, um, uh, so, so yes, so on, on Sunday, we'll have part two of this, um, and you can uh, find uh, the video on our Facebook channel. Um, Dr. Grossman, what's the best way for people to contact you um, if they're for oh, example, oh, I, should, or not? I should have said, okay, so I have a website. There's good information on there as well. And my website is, is my name. Miriam Grossman, M-I-R-I-A-M-G-R-O-S-S-M-A-N-M-D, no punctuation, uh, dot com. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, uh, any any closing remarks before, before we uh, close then, Dr. Grossman? I'm just so glad for everyone that participated. How many people did we have in the end? So we'd had about uh, about 16, 17 people. I think there's still about 13 okay. people which are, are still uh, still online. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks everyone uh, for joining and hopefully we will join, continue in next week's session. Thank you. God bless.